hardware resiliency. Today, she will talk about her more recent work addressing the architectural challenges of supporting virtual, augmented, and mixed realities. Another area we can look forward to some of the foundational work in computer architecture. Please join me in welcoming Serena. Welcome everybody. Uh, it is a, a tremendous honor to be uh, presenting at ISCA after three years. Um, let me just take a moment to, to, um, to acknowledge the hardship that many of our community have been through over the last few years. Um, I think uh, a lot has happened um, and I just want to acknowledge that. Okay, so the, the title of my talk is Enabling the Immersive Era of Computing. This is work that I've done with many students and collaborators. I'm going to acknowledge them as I go through the slides. Okay, well, all right, so, um, we started, uh, we were like this three years ago, two years ago, um, in deeply um, immersive 3D environments in person. And then this happened to the last screen. And we did have opportunities to uh, involve, to get into more immersive 3D experiences, for example, using avatars like this. And this was better than Zoom. But it was not the same dealing with these unrealistic avatars. My collaborator at CMU, Anthony Rowe, has uh, been leading a system called Arena, which is a, a platform to host and program multi user uh, extended reality experiences. And uh, I had the opportunity to attend a poster session and a social event in the Arena. So they replaced the avatars with just video boxes of people. Okay? And that just made such a difference. I mean, this was really fun event to go to, but still, still leaving a lot to be desired. So wouldn't it, it be wonderful if we had the ability to interact with realistic holograms of our uh, colleagues and friends and family in physical spaces that are our own with virtual and physical objects that, that we could interact with seamlessly. And that is a promise of immersive computing. It is the seamless integration of the physical with the virtual in real time, completely mobile and comfortable all day long. So under the broad umbrella of immersive computing, I include virtual, augmented, and mixed reality, uh, collectively uh, referred to as extended reality. And I'm often going to use extended reality or XR interchangeably with this. I also include the metaverse, digital twins, spatial computing, or whatever the new uh, hot, uh, uh, buzzword is. So immersive computing, I believe, has the potential to transform most activities that that, that humans do. We started this, this whole uh, journey as, as pure sci-fi, read about it in books, saw it in movies, but now we are starting to see the potential for, for this uh, technology through applications that exist today. So here is one where autistic children are using VR uh, for, for better social experiences, 
uh, we are being used uh, in aging care centers to uh, deal with isolation from COVID, for pain control, uh, for industrial uh, manufacturing and maintenance, um, in, in uh, emergency management situations. And it's used a lot in healthcare today. Uh, so we started collaborating with uh, folks from our medical hospital, medical school, and nearby hospitals. And they say that physicians and surgeons who use 3D reconstruction, it's used a lot in surgery planning and training, that those who use these, uh, these technologies just don't want to go back. It actually makes a difference to their plan for how they do their surgery. And now it's also coming inside the operating room Although uh, the physicians and the surgeons would like to do uh, real time community really constructions, they are not able to do that yet in real time, but they would like to do that. And not only that, they can actually be even more aspirational and think of immersive mobile hospitals that we put up in a crisis situation where uh, our teams of physicians and, and surgeons that are geographically distributed can deliver healthcare to the people they need. So really, you just have to let your imagination run. How is it going to change is, is, is just a matter of, 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 uh, of, of imagining. And in fact, this is actually, in, I believe, this is a new era of computing. We are on the brink of a, of a new era. And what do I mean by a new era? Think about when we started from mainframes. We went to personal computing in the home. The web and the cloud and the internet came along. Mobile computing happened, and now immersive. And each of these eras has been transformative. And I believe it will be the same with immersive. Each era has changed how we design, program, and use computers. And I believe it will be the same with immersive computing. And another thing to remember is that before we had all of these eras, we would never have imagined some of the applications and markets that were opened up by these technologies. Who would have imagined YouTube? Who would have imagined Airbnb? And the same thing is probably going to happen with immersive computing. So, how do we? I've said all this, I've talked about the potential, but we are not quite there yet. This dream, we are not quite there yet. We see, we see that the science fiction is, is now getting to a point where the technologies are coming together. And we can start to dream that we can make the science fiction a reality now. But what will it take? This is going to require uh, advances in the hardware, in the software, and in the applications of the system. It's going to require advances across the entire set of computing platforms that we know in sensors, in displays, headsets, wearables, the edge and cloud backends that are going to power this technology and network. This is a broad systems problem, and we as a community should want to embrace it. So, when we started a few years ago, there wasn't much of, 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 for architects uh, in this space. Uh, so, just like any architect, um, uh, you know, we started doing a survey of okay, what's out there, right? Where do we stand? And what we found immediately that there is an orders of magnitude gap in the power, performance, and quality of experience between the current headsets. And we use headsets because they are you know, the most visible uh, uh, sort of manifestation of this technology. So orders of magnitude difference um, in, in where we are today and what we desire. So we did a huge survey of the literature out there, and you can see uh, the full table in our paper, but just as an example, if you think about the resolution in megapixels uh, of where we want to be, uh, people have done studies and, and, and they've targeted for about 200 megapixels for, for really rich immersive experiences. Where we are right now with the state of the art headsets is about seven. For power, you're wearing these headsets uh, all day long. You want, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're sitting, or well, that's the dream, that you want them all day long, you're sitting on your face. So you don't want to be burning, you know, burning your skin. And so roughly the compute power budget that we have is about 100 million bucks. Yeah, million bucks. And what we have in today's headset is about seven bucks. 
in terms of weight, we want the form factor of these headsets to be something like this, right? We want to, we want this to be comfortable. And so the weight that we want to target is order of 10 grams, but what we have today is about 500 grams. So again, orders of magnitude difference. So this is actually, as an architect for us, is very exciting, right? Finally, we get to work in an area that needs that orders of magnitude. Uh, difference of uh, improvement in performance, power, quality, etc. So that's great. That's a great challenge. However, we found that there were several other challenges that made working in this area really hard. So the first one is that you need diverse expertise to make an impact in this area. You need to uh, understand graphics, vision, audio, video, optics, haptics. Um, the second problem is the metrics. The metrics for this area are fairly complex and in fact are by themselves a huge body of research. So you'll find paper upon paper uh, 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 you know, proposing new metrics to measure the goodness of, of uh, the various components of the systems as well as the actual experience. So there are multiple user-driven and user-driven metrics that, uh, uh, that depend on end-to-end quality of experience, something we're not really used to. And then there's the whole uh, aspect of needing to move forward across all of the layers because no one layer is going to cut it. And so uh, to get the amplification of the impact of technologies in each of these layers, we want to look at co-design, we want to look at cross-layer systems. And so we want to work with the hardware, the compiler, the OS, the algorithms, as well as it's a full distributed system problem. So it's the end user devices, the edge, as well as uh, the cloud. And then this last one was the one that did us most badly. So uh, when we started, everything in this area was closed. There were closed systems behind company firewalls. A uh, few people wanted to talk to us right away. And there were few participants in this area. There were no open reference of uh, systems or benchmarks to do research. And so we, we, we jumped into this area because we were super excited about the potential. Right? And we thought, okay, finally we get to do architecture in a domain that I really care about and it's going to make a difference. But hey, there's just nothing to go with. Okay? So then we realized that the biggest problem in this area was there's this huge barrier to entry for open RD. And so we took a pivot and we said, all right, what we're going to do in the next few years is figure out how can we democratize XR systems, research, development, and benchmark. And so that's how the Elixir of uh, project was born, the Elixir system was born. This is the Illinois Extended Reality Testbed. Elixir is now, uh, it is an open source, full system XR testbed for a headset. Okay? It has state-of-the-art XR components with a modular runtime. It's compatible with uh, the open XR standard, which is emerging at that time. It wasn't even there when we started. This is the standard for applications. Uh, to use to write to XR systems. So now it's an open standard, which is really fantastic. And now we use Elixir uh, for extensively characterizing XR systems and we use it for research and we're able to make progress. So uh, just to show you that Elixir is real, it's not just vaporware. I have a series of videos here. Um, so this one is how we use Elixir sort of day to day for our research. Uh, there's no headset here. Um, you know, a student, my student here is walking around uh, in this gray, uh, the gray window at the bottom. He's walking around the lab with the camera. Uh, this window on the left here, the laser room is uh, is the virtual space. So the gray one is the physical space he's running. Uh, the, uh, uh, the the yellow one is the is the, the laser room is the virtual space that his headset is going through. So you can see this third person view. It helps us debug what's happening in the system. And then on the right, we have this window, which is really the uh, what what uh, what Elixir is putting out. Okay, so if you have a headset, that's what you can see. But this will be doing this on the desktop just as a as a way for us to do research day to day. And you can see that Elixir is tracking pretty well and rendering pretty well as well. Okay, so now uh, here's uh, Elixir uh, using a headset for its display. So uh, we have uh, my student, uh, uh, you know, have this really long portable system that we developed. Right? So Elixir is running on this PC that Jeffrey is walking around with, and Elixir is generating 
generating the pixels that we're sending to this North Star, uh, which is an open source headset, uh, using the headset just as a display. All of the computation really is happening on the PC with the laser software. Okay, and you can see this side by side uh, visualization. This is exactly uh, uh, the, uh, to my right is what uh, Joseph is uh, is seeing through the through the headset. Uh, this is uh, the famous Ponza castle that that we walk around, and again tracking words, rendering words, you know the, the whole thing uh, works. So then we jettison the uh, the innovative mobile thing, the drawing. Uh, uh, you know, Joseph's friend Jeffrey said I'm not coming with you, and so we put. Uh, we put a laser on this backpack you see that HD makes, and uh, and now just can walk around tether us and enjoy his exercise. Okay, so all this works. And then very recently, we're very excited that uh, we have been able to offload components of the laser to remote com uh, computers. Okay, so if you can't do all of this stuff uh, in the headset, we can offload some parts of it to the remote computers. And so here we are showing. Uh, 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 this uh, this here is the backpack you see on the right corner. On the left corner, of my right, I guess, uh, corner is the is is a is a heavier server, and they're connected to the router that's sitting at the top. The monitors are sitting on top of the respective uh, computers, and um, and then uh, the laser is sending tracking computation over from the backpack PC to the to the server and animal. Okay, so this is just a proof of concept right now, showing that offloading works for the laser, but there's a long, long way to go to do this uh, really right. So this is just in this environment with this application that works, and I'll talk about the research later. Okay, so all of this works. It's great. Um, we've done a lot with the laser, but we are not going to be able to solve this problem. This is a huge, huge problem with a lot of potential, and so we launched the laser consortium. This is a consortium um, with industry and academic partners. Um, the initial members were ARM, Facebook, um, uh, Micron, and Nutsa, NVIDIA, etc. Uh, and the goals of, of this uh, consortium are um, essentially to democratize XR um, systems uh, research development and benchmarking that I said before. Okay, so in particular, we want to create with the community uh, building on a laser, a reference open source XR testbed that we can all agree upon um, as something we would, we, would, we would all use. Right? So it needs to have the right components and interfaces, a bunch of really sensible runtime, lots of telemetry. And then we also want to establish a benchmarking methodology because it simply doesn't exist today in this area. So, what applications, what data sets, what system configurations, and what methods. Um, and then we also want to build a community. And the XR systems community is very fragmented today. So we would like to build a systems and uh, research and development. And this is now uh, funded by uh, NSF has this really cool community research infrastructure program. So it is now funded by that. Uh, originally, it was funded by a uh, center uh, uh, that, that I will talk about later. OK, so uh, if you're interested, please join us. We have weekly meeting. This is spent right now while we're all at ISCA, et cetera. Uh, but we'll be start in July. Uh, send us email to our website. So. Okay, so that's sort of where we are with laser. But I want to take a deep dive and tell you uh, what you know. What what is the laser really really do? Okay, so um, before I do that, I want to thank Team the Laser. There's lots and lots of people who have contributed to this. They're all sitting up here. Or many of them are sitting up here. Um, and lots of consultants, the, the way this happened was lots of talking with a lot of people in industry and academia trying to figure things out, what state of the art, how does this all work, et cetera. And then our founding consortium members and the founding sponsor. And most of all, I want to uh, acknowledge Zeta, uh, my student who's sitting uh, right up here. Uh, he's really the heart and soul, and you know, he's been leading the laser from, from day one. And uh, leading the, the slash team, and he's just super amazing, and he's bad. Okay, so, um, so over here, and this is how a uh, uh, generic sort of XR system works. Okay, so there are three different um, pipelines of subsystems in an XR system uh, the perception uh, pipeline, the visual pipeline, and the audio pipeline. And each of these has several components. 
And all of these components, they talk to each other, they communicate with each other in our system to the digital communication interface network. Um, XR applications then, so your, uh, you know, I talked about the medical infrastructure, et cetera. So those are the applications that run on top of all of this. And um, uh, we can run applications directly to the Elixir interface, or we can go through the OpenXR interface. Uh, we're very fortunate to uh, with the Monado group to use their OpenXR interface implementation. And then all of this uh, runs on mobile device. So today, uh, uh, most of all, all of this is in software. So if you, if you go to Elixir or you can get this software for all the orange stuff. But of course, the part of the research that we're doing is how to make the, you know, how to uh, accelerate parts of this, how to build hardware for this, etc. And so more of that. And then, as I said, we can offload uh, tracking and we have the machinery to, to offload a lot of this. Okay, so that's uh, uh, the overview. And then I'm going to just do a few quick sort of tutorial on you know, what all of these things are so we get a sense of what's happening in XR So in the perception pipeline, this is what tells the user where in the world they are and what uh, uh, what the world around them looks like. Okay, this is what this is what is uh, part of the system. Uh, so this includes a lot of sensors like cameras and inertial measurement units. Um, a key part here is tracking where your head is, and so we use um, a visual inertial geometry or VIO. This provides the position and the head orientation of the user. Okay, or well, what's going to the pose? And VIO is a is a fairly accurate. A version of the pose, however, it runs slow, it does a lot of computation, and so it's not computing the pose fast enough. And the IMU uh, computes a pose uh, quickly, but it's inaccurate. And so the IMU integrator is another important component that integrates these two poses to create uh, a high frequency, accurate pose estimations. And then we also need a pose predictor because, as we'll see later, we're going to be predicting the future pose to compensate for the long latencies that a lot of these components take. And the user cannot absolutely handle. Okay, so we have a position that goes in there. And then we have seen reconstruction, which uses RGB depth cameras to build a dense 3D uh, map of the world around. Okay, so then you can interact with, uh, 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 with that map. And then you have eye tracking. This is not, uh, this is still running off a data set. We don't have uh, uh, actual eye tracking cameras yet, but uh, soon we hope to. The visual pipeline is what is sending, uh, you know, uh, generating the pixels for, for this thing. And so a key part of this visual pipeline is something called asynchronous projection. The application that's running on the laser is doing the rendering based on you know, whatever uh, physics, etc., cetera, that, that, that it's computing and, and, uh, and, and sending a laser a rendered frame. But from the time that the application got a pose from the laser, to figure out the user's perspective and generate the frame for that perspective, the user's head may have moved. And so now the system needs to compensate for that latency and, and get um, a, a new pose and then just adjust that rendering quickly so that it can generate the frame from the new perspective. Okay? And this is a really critical part to cut out of uh, uh, what's called the motion to photo latency and is a key metric for XR. So motion to photon is simply uh, the time that it took to move from there to how long did it take to change the frame that you see. Okay, so the time, the motion, to the time that the photons were actually displayed. And what reprojection does is it helps to cut this because it's doing post prediction and so on, so that it's predicting poses in the future and based on that it's working the render frame quickly to get it out there just enough. And then there's a bunch of uh, dense distortion and chromatic aberration that happens because of the nature of these lenses. And so we correct for that. And we do some computational holography. We don't have holographic displays, but we have the computation. Uh, and this is used to, uh, to generate multiple focal planes that can fix some, some artifacts, of the really important artifacts that, that, that happen. Okay. The third pipeline is the audio pipeline. Uh, this is 3D station audio, so we do audio encoding, we have encode multiple sound sources into a high order, uh, order uh, sonic sound field. We play audio back, we, uh, we rotate and zoom this intro sound field for the user to expose so that you know, the audio is consistent with where, where you're looking and what you're doing, and perform panoralization to account for the shape of the user's face, etc. <coughs> okay. 
So, so these are all individual components that are, that are described, right? But XR is not just each of these components individually. XR is just, it's, it's a full system. And so what's happening in the system? What does the data flow look like? Well, there's this IMU running at a really, really high frequency, generating these, these inactive poses. There's the camera that's running at a much lower frequency. Both of these are feeding to the BIO, the tracking mechanism. And then we have the IMU integrator that's taking data from the BIO, taking data from, from the IMU. There's eye tracking going on. There's CD construction that uses data from the camera. There's the application that's using data from many of these things. There's the projection, again, with lots of um, uh, data dependencies, hologram, audio encoding, uh, audio playback, etc. So there's a lot going on in the system. There's different components running at different frequencies, there are multiple interacting pipelines, uh, and there are these what we call synchronous and asynchronous dependencies. So synchronous are the ones where a component a consumer has to wait for the producer to happen, asynchronous are the ones where the consumer says, ah, I'll just take the latest whatever information you have, and that's represented by solid versus dotted lines. Um, and there are multiple quality of experience metrics that can balance of you know, orchestrating all this stuff. Okay, so Elisa does all of this. Elisa Rundown is what does all of this. Um, and we tried our hardest to make this a very modular and flexible architecture so that, um, uh, so that people can plug and play. Uh, you can use um, uh, different um, algorithms and, and the pull out component, pull in, pull in another one of these things. So, Elixir components are just plugins. Uh, they're separately compiled, dynamically loaded, and you can easily swap, uh, add new components, new implementations of components. And, so on. and at the same time, we did not want to sacrifice efficiency because that's really the name of the game. You cannot have a good XR experience unless you're efficient. And so, we have a fairly efficient, flexible previous database. Um, uh, it's, it's based on event streams and public subscribe, but it uses shared memory, so no, no, no undersea copy of data, um, and uh, supports these synchronous and asynchronous components. Okay, so at the end of the day, we have an endpoint system that does all these, has all these components, does all this orchestration, and balances uh, flexibility with efficiency. Okay, what can you run on Elixir today? Uh, we can run um, uh, applications directly to Elixir, okay? Or we can use uh, open XR applications that exist out there um, and using the Monado implementation of the open XR interface that I mentioned. So today we can, uh, most of our experiments are with the Renault game engine, that's an open source that has a game engine that is open XR compatible. And Unity and Unreal recently um, um, uh, uh, announced that they would have uh, open XR. Uh, Linux implementations as well, and so uh, we will have this one too. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, so so we do run Linux right now, but we have an Android on all of those things. And then we have uh, several different quality metrics that we measure. I talked about most of on latency. Uh, we measure image quality. Uh, we use the state of the art metrics. They're not great. I mean, you can see. So we look at the headset and the metrics say, "Oh, it's great. It's not great." And it's like, no, that's not quite the way you're seeing it, but these are the best metrics we have, and, and uh, we've implemented them, we use them, and uh, extensive telemetric uh, frame rates, experience, stack distributions, power, etc. So, okay. So, uh, Elixir supports many components today, uh, you know, in all of these pipelines. Some of them, uh, you'll see, we have multiple implementations, so again, you can use different implementations. These, these algorithms are changing, right, as we speak. And so this type of modularity and flexibility, flexibility is really important. Like over the course of our project, we've, uh, we've, uh, we've seen things change and, and they're able to adapt. Okay, so that was about the system and what Elixir is able to do. The next thing I'm going to briefly talk about is some of the findings that we had when um, uh, evaluating this system. So uh, how did we evaluate? Well, we ran a laser on a high-end uh, desktop machine. We saw uh, Jeffrey Dolan that PC around. And that was to give us sort of an upper limit, right, on what, on what we can do. And then we also ran it on an embedded machine, the Nvidia Jetson, to be closer to what uh, real headsets might be like today. Okay. Uh, not what they need to be, but, but this is what we have. We ran uh, this on 
in a high power performance mode of jets and a low, a low power mode. Uh, we took some sort of standard applications like Sponza and so on uh, on the Renault uh, uh, game engine, and uh, these vary in graphics intensity. Okay, so um, the interesting thing, the first interesting thing about this evaluation methodology is this column that I'm going to get there. There are so many different components in the system. Each of them has so many different configurations, and they interact with each other in so many ways that tuning the system to get it ready for evaluation was a big feat in itself. And so all of this tuning, we had no experience, right? nothing to go by. Uh, we did this manual. Okay. I can just say B, I don't want to do B back. It's B, it's B. Right? So they did this manually. And um and uh, and those were the were the uh, uh, parameters we came up with. Uh, you know, I don't want to go into the details here, but the point is that uh, tuning and configuring an XR system automatically is by itself. A recent project, and I will talk. Uh, uh, yes, I'll, I'll talk about that. Okay, so we have a lot of results. I don't have the time to go through them all in detail. I'm just going to give you a very sort of broad bird's eye view. Um, so we we looked at frame rates of the different components running the whole system. Uh, we looked at execution times for each per frame for each of these components. We looked at the distributions of the execution times. Uh, we looked at where time was being spent in which component, is it this use and use and PIO, etc. Uh, power, you know, where was it spent again, which, which uh, software component, which hardware component, for your experience, what type of most people have been seeing as seeing, and uh, the image quality methods. Okay. So there's a lot of information here, it's all in, in our paper. But suffice to say that these are the first published uh, performance power and quality of experience results for an end to end XR system. Right? And so these, uh, I won't go through the numbers, but I will quickly summarize the implications for system research. And in fact, these implications have set the research agenda for my group for, I think it's going to be at least 10 years. Um, so, what, what, uh, what, you know, what did we find? Well, not so Surprisingly, but now we have uh, we have uh, evidence that is a substantial performance power and fuel gap, and so we need to specialize hardware, software, and the entire system. Okay, so it's not just about a single component; it's not just about a single part of the system. And if no application component dominates all the metrics, we need to consider all the application components in the system together. And this is really important. So if you are only looking at performance, you might go and work on VIO or rendering. But if you are looking at uh, most before on latency, you would immediately realize that rejection is super important. So even if it takes a tiny amount of time each time it's invoked. Okay? But it needs to run at that time. It needs to run without interference. And so if you didn't know about QE, you didn't look at the whole picture. You go and optimize for VIO, and maybe that would take you up your GPU, and, and you know, the regression is not work, or get you not, etc. And you don't have a good system. Power consumption goes beyond the CPU, GPU, and VR. Um, you, know, you need to consider all of the sensors, the display, and all the IO that's going on. Right? So it's a system level problem. And there's statistical variability. So even for components that, that are not and you would think are not input dependent. We saw a lot of variability in the frame times, and that's because there's so much interference going on. Our schedule was not really dealing with that interference, well, in part because we don't have a technical security over that. And then finally, like uh, the four component metrics. So a lot of work is per component. You take the VIO and say, okay, how accurate is the pose? All right. You can see the construction. Say, okay, how accurate is the mesh? Right. Um, but really, you need to look at the entire system to make. QOE driven trade offs. Um, and this is really hard, but we found that over and over again, looking through the headset made a huge difference to figure out what was going on. Okay. Uh, then we did a lot of, um, so that was about system level results. And then as architects, of course, we like to benchmark into the components. We did that too. And we found, you know, IPC and, and you know, where the time was spent uh, and 
and figure out you know, what are the key primitives to use and what memory primitives that are going on. And so a lot of implementation there as well. There are so many tasks going on, even within each component, there's no single task that dominates. And so you really need automated techniques to determine what is going to be profitable, profitable to use that way. Um, you probably need to build a shared hardware, because it's probably not going to be reasonable to accelerate the current task. And you probably want to start off with it was very clear to us that, oh, you know, all those is really important. You've got to start working in that area. Okay, uh, there's a diversity of primitives, so you need flexible memory hierarchies, uh, algorithms are in flux, so this is for Apple. And then the whole QA business comes back over and over again. Uh, the different algorithms have different profiles for QA versus usage, and you need to be able to do this end to end. Uh, QE driven approximate computing. And by approximate computing, because again, uh, we deal with human perception, there's no right answer here. There's a range of, of comfortable experiences, and so we need to use as well. Okay, so, so in general, Elixir is a really rich playground for systems research, and I, and I hope uh, you will join us in, in this. But, you know, I said a lot of things, and as I said, this is really driving my research for many years. Um, uh, uh, and we'll talk about specific research in a bit. But really stepping back, right? Just stepping back a bit. What this is telling us is it's time to do a new style of research. And I know several of you are already doing this type of work. But broadly, as a community, uh, it's really time to do a new style of research. And what do I mean by that? Well, first, I'm going to say three things. Okay, so the first one is co design. I think we've seen this a lot. I think we sort of grasp that as a community. I don't know if we fully internalized it, but we, we sort of know that, you know, these stacks, all of them, we need to work on all of them, work on them together, co design, etc. But in this area for XR, given those tight latency requirements, okay, the motion to put on latency needs to be less than 20 milliseconds for a VR system and less than 5 milliseconds for an AR system. These are sort of the exact requirements. Okay? That's really, really small. And so how do you do that? Um, without bringing in algorithms. Uh, so the projection, for example, is an algorithm. How do you do that without thinking about the underlying central motor technologies? How do you do that without thinking about how to program? Why you can't? Okay, so then it's not just these, it's not just, you know, one headset. I've talked about, I focus my talk on one headset because that's where we are from this point, let's start somewhere. Um, but the, the amazing applications out there, right, the promise of XR is in these geographically distributed collaborations that have user experiences. And so you have many of these headsets and variables and different form factor devices um, interacting together. And these are part of a larger ecosystem. There's the edge, there's the cloud, there's the networks in between, and we have to take advantage of all of this to bring to there and, and give us the performance that we need for, for this domain. With those high latency constraints, okay? and there's a lot of bandwidth that you have, you can't just be shoving a, you know, a large print around all over the net. Okay, so this is a really hard problem, but we need to get, uh, get going on this. And so we, when I talk about code design, I talk about code design this Right. For me, XR, immersive computing, is this whole thing. Okay, finally, the third point. So it's code design, the distributed system, and then quality of experience. So I've talked about this over and over again. So um, uh, you know, by quality of experience, um, there are so many different computers. Right? We have uh, the users looking at images, so, uh, so uh, uh, the quality of that, Wi-Fi, the quality of audio, you have haptics, the quality of that. Uh, of course, you want to keep doing your power performance area stuff, right? I mean, that's really popular in but Of course, you want to keep doing that. But in addition, you also want to look at these other higher level quality uh, metrics. And then, XR is one domain that you can actually physically hurt the user if you're not in a good job. Right? So if you want a headset for a long amount of time, you know you can get this together and you can have a headache, Fatigue, buff, right? So uh, those are the quality of experience metrics that we need to bring in to the system. How do you do that? Um, so again, you know, we are not used to this type of research, so it's end-to-end, QE-driven, post-system program. Sounds hard, and it is hard, right? But, you know, we can check away at this, right? We 
have we, we, we are uh, uh, you know we've done we've done this in the past that kind of thing. And so um, I'm just gonna give you like a super quick bird's eye view of all of the research that's going on with the laser. Um, and these are just projects that uh, sort of we collaborate with various people. So um, I talked about the, you know the, an example of co-design with semiconductor technologies and architecture and everything else above. Uh, so we are working with Gage Hills and David Brooks from Harvard. Uh, Gage is um, uh, an expert in 3D integration, so he works on lower levels of stack. And uh, we're looking at integrating compute, memory, and sensing. And this is a game changer for Excel. Right? If you if you can bring sensing and, and, and compute together, for example, and ensure that only highly processed information um, is what is running around, right? No, no raw data, then that changes power and changes. Uh, performance metrics, it's a big deal for security and privacy, which I haven't done enough justice to in this talk. Uh, you know, there's a whole whole um, set of things there, but, but this can be a game changer. And so with the age, we are you know, exploring these architectures, and it's not just architecture, it affects algorithms. Once you can do on sensing, you know, sensing and compute together, compute memory together, what does that do to the algorithms up there and how you take advantage? We're also doing a design space exploration with Elixir. So all this is enabled now uh, by Elixir. Um, so looking at things like, you know, is it better to do more of a 3D for this uh, technology or to uh, chip stacking or to uh, 5D uh, with, uh, with chiplets? So all of those questions. If you want to do um, co-design architecture with the upper levels of the stack, then we have to have a story for the interface that this architecture is going to provide for the compiler that's going to compile this. And so there we've been working with uh, Vikram Arvind and Sasha Sadovich on a uh, compiler in the region representation uh, called HPDM, Heterogeneous Parallel Virtual Machine. This project is not running, it did not start for the laser, it did not start for XR, it started as a general compiler um, IR for uh, and a virtual uh, uh, hardware ISA for uh, heterogeneous power systems. And, uh, and it's great for a laser. So we are now compiling a laser, uh, uh, or we have an ongoing project for representing a laser with, with HPDM. And the cool thing about HPDM is that it, um, it represents computation as um, in the compiler IR as a set of, um, as a hierarchical data flow graph. Um, can capture uh, different kinds of parallelism, communication, and whatnot, and uh, supports many high level optimizations as graph transformation. We use it to target CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, various accelerators, etc. And now we're using it for Linksert, both for code generation, for automated accelerator selection, approximation, and scheduling. So um, the next uh, thing is again uh, taking picking up with, with the laptop HPDM and using that to help us do uh, you know I mentioned that we need to have automated selection and generation of accelerator hardware and software. So that's a project we're doing uh, with the Kamarbe as well as David Brooks and Peter Bay and and uh, um, I've been doing a lot of work on um, on memory systems. Uh, accelerated communication interfaces, coherence, consistency, etc. And I have been making the case for many years, and, and, and I'm glad to see this happen that accelerators also need to be treated as first class entities within the coherence protocol, and you know, their memory systems need to be coherent, etc. But guess what? Now we have another new entity called the sensor, right? We have the network. And all of these today are treated as IO, which is extremely inefficient. We cannot have an efficiency in the system. And so we're looking at bringing all of this into the global address space, into a shared coherent hierarchy. What does that do? How, how do you do that? There's lots of interesting questions there. And this is building up on our work on standards that, that, that we did a couple of years ago. Uh, I talked about approximations. So this is a, a so, so the previous one was you know, again co design within the higher layer of sensing and several, et cetera. Approximation is again going back to whole stack, compiler, hardware, and so on. Uh, so we have a system uh, that uh, we use for another algorithms and now plan to laser that's an automated end-to-end -end, uh, approximation tuning uh, engine. Uh, it's called HPDM. 
But the key thing is this is that it looks at end to end POV. And so that's what um, uh, the work is all going with this. And so again, we need from our instruction. And then we have given a laser, we have a lot of work on looking at different components in the laser, looking at the end to end system, and thinking about how to co design all of this. Um, and just for CMD construction, for example, just exploiting the fact that we have a full system has enabled us just with software optimizations or external optimizations, system level software insights that have yielded 69x better energy per frame with only software. And from a hardware point of view, it totally changes the bottom line. It totally changes what you want to sell. Okay, so again, this is another example. And then we have our track four meter generating robot. Uh, scheduling, working with uh, Brad Rothery and Rajika Mittal. I talked about QOE driven scheduling, so lots of work going on there. And then the offloading, you know, moving. So, this is the next big thing for us is moving the laser from a single device to a distributed uh, scenario. I show you how we are able to offload now, but there's just so many questions there. Um, you know, being able to offload that we can realize is, uh, is going to be really important. I mean, the hundred million dollars of power is just a ridiculously small budget. And yet, offloading means you're spending energy, you know, transferring bits to put those square bits is really high for the network technologies. Um, you're, you're spending time compressing, energy compressing. So, what do you offload? When and where? What kind of compression? What kind of networking technologies? How do you bring the network? Um, into into our uh, optimization strategy. How do you integrate this with the scheduler? And so we are working with a group like Intel. We're working with some people um, at at Illinois, um, uh, uh, at uh, at uh, Brighton, and at at to do all of this. And this is going to have an impact on cellular design of the algorithm, and the scheduler, and everything. We are also starting to work on multi-user immersive systems. Okay, so immersive applications which you have to distribute users. And then we're primarily working with Ampiro from CMU. I already mentioned the Arena project. So first we're going to bring Arena on top of Elixir, we're already doing that, uh, so that Elixir can then host to Arena uh, multi-user experiences. But the very interesting um, uh, uh, part would be to actually integrate Arena within Elixir, inside Elixir, so that we make um, design decisions about or run that decision about where, what combination is going to run where, and so on, this entire distribution. So, again, very long term agenda, then you reject. And there's so much more. I didn't do any justice to security attacks. And this is like a huge deal. We're starting to do work in this area, and uh, you know, it goes on and on. So, we on the brink of this new immersive era, era right? In a this is going to transform, I truly believe. It's going to transform how we design, program, and use computers. And I think this community really needs to up its game, embrace this, be part of this. We have so much to offer to this technology, but we do need a new style of research. Uh, we do need end-to-end QOE-driven post-system co-design. What this means in practice is we need to start building systems more. This includes chips, compilers, runtimes, applications, do user studies. We're going to have to work in larger teams. This is like the early days of computers. It's, it's starting over here. I mean, all the, everything's new, right? You can't, I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to say things work unless they work. So this is really hard. And this is what I mean, so this is too many changes in the community. <laughs> <laughs> we need new styles of reviewing, right? The laser paper was rejected four times from top conferences. And the one that got published and selected as micro topics wasn't that different from the last session. So I want to take this as a segue to really acknowledge my students here who, who go through so much. So thank you, thank you folks. Uh, we also need new kinds of funding. So the only reason that it later happened was because we were part of this uh, DARPA SRC funded uh, AI Research Center uh, uh, with the director of the director. 
and a and, and the center and it's a unique ecosystem and i don't need to go into details here but it's what made us uh, you know do something that we knew nothing about to start with and and we need to see more of this you know risk taking and high risk kind of what kind of kind of thing we were also fortunate that along with the data center we also were part of a larger team as part of a DARPA resource program project with IBM, uh, both Kelly and the other universities. We saw a lot of the work that, that we did, the research was part of that, because that was about an adjacent domain that I'm just and the two kind of kind of synergized really, really well. And then now recently we received the size community infrastructure grant, and you know, it's funny what a big deal it is because it allows us to hire programmers, etc., to keep this up. So new startups are coming in as well. And it's now, I hope that you're all inspired to work in this area, and I hope that it sort of helps you. Um, it is a rich playground for emergency systems research. Uh, join the consortium, you know, come in, attend our meetings. It's a really nice group. We have fun. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's my talk. So much, Sarita. Uh, please come up to the mic with questions. Um, India, Sarita. Oh, I got that. Uh, this is Kartal and Adam Google. Thanks for a very inspired talk. Uh, you alluded to this a few times about uh, edge and cloud. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what you see as the challenges in edge computing? Particularly, uh, uh, what are the differences uh, compared to, say, uh, edge computing solutions for online gaming? So, how does XR? change some of the assumptions. Yeah, so the latency is a huge deal, right? Again, we're talking about a motion to put on latency of five milliseconds, which you're never going to get by offering. So you have to have a compensation and so on, right? But that latency, the very low latency and very high bandwidth requirements, right? The combination of that is 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 a killer. Hi, this is Jan from UCRA. So I have a question. Since for rendering algorithms, the demand of computing resources fluctuates dramatically. So if we stay in this meeting room, maybe it's a close thing. So we are, I mean, it requires limited computing resources. But if we go outside in the open air, so it takes, I mean, extremely more resources for renders. So how do you deal with this practical fluctuation? For the system resource scheduling and the yeah. yeah huge huge problem right and so yeah. so the questions about how you adapt to changes not in you know what you described is in the scene just at the application level uh changes but there's changes in the networking available right? changes in what compute you have available um and so a big part of our of our research agenda in the future relates to the stack of resource management and um, and you know how you adapt to these changing requirements and we saw a glimpse and there's just so much to talk about right you know you know the 25 to 15 minute talk but uh the work that we did on the QE with the scheduling is sort of an initial step in that direction and then you know it's as i said it's a it's a very long research agenda but you are exactly right that the system is so dynamic that's uh, that's what thank you so that question. Yeah, thank you. How does one synchronize the constraints on movement between physical and virtual? It may, the lab may be perfectly open, but the castle may have a wall. And it's perfectly legal to yeah. walk in the lab, but you may be crossing and walking through a wall in the virtual. And the converse is also true. Yeah. Virtual might be open and you may run into Yeah, so the converse is worse, right? Because you can get against the wall. Right, exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So these are all these system level questions that are sort of there's, there's there's a lot of work in the sort of algorithms community that's that's actually dealing with these problems. You know, the arena system has has uh, ways of dealing with these problems. Um, I will admit I'm not an expert on on you know all of that. This is stuff we are learning, and um, uh, but these kinds of things lead to new threats, right? So I was saying I mentioned a little bit about how a person can be physically hurt. Yes. But imagine now that you know you have a malicious attack 
where you end up getting a wall, tripping and falling. So these are all security and privacy related problems that are new to this world. And there's a lot of research going on. And I don't claim to be an expert on anything like about this stuff right now, but if you invite me to a keynote five years later, then maybe I'll have to <laughs> Uh, but we are, uh, so we have collaborators, and we, we have a pretty large effort going on. We're, we're working on something like this. Sorry, uh, you've been coming to this whole thing. A really awesome talk. I really enjoyed the server of chair. Um, <laughs> um, one area that I found really interesting is the onboarding piece. Uh, so you mentioned that you guys are starting with kind of onboarding the traffic piece to the server. So I'm wondering what's the particular way that a commerce can make with that onboarding. And a follow up to that, right? Then you have the insights from this idea on how to make also even really work in this kind of complex ecosystem, just being with the network and you know, yeah. level of computer. Yeah. It's very tricky, right? Because you, like, because this type kind of latency is yeah. So, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it is tricky. It is, again, you know, part of our research agenda. I, you know, what I'm describing here is, is lots and lots and lots of work to do, right? Uh, so, why did we use VIO initially for offloading? I mean, this is something that. Was a challenge to us. People you know, think that this is not possible, uh, but um, uh, what what a user gives us is that we have the entire runtime on the phone, right? And so a lot of the offloading work really happens within the application because that's what people have in their control. And we wanted to do something that was inside the runtime just to show, right, the benefit of the laser because. Unless you have something like a laser, right? Also, I mean, trending is just not something you can try, right? And so it was like a challenge, right? But, and then our results showed that offloading has um, is a uh, tracking takes a lot. So, and then there's, there's so what we did is really fairly simple. There's a lot more we can to make this pick up better. Uh, your other question, just how to make offloading better. Uh, hey, you know, again, like I, I've been talking about this for about half an hour, right? So, yeah. Um, Entire 